The following interview was part of the research carried out for an episode of Imagining Tomorrow, a hope-filled podcast made in partnership with Friends of the Earth. A link to the episode can be found in the video notes, or you can go to foe.uk forward slash imagining tomorrow to find all of the episodes released so far. Enjoy! Hello Matt, hello, hello Paul. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for giving me your time. I was wondering if you could introduce yourselves, please. Yeah, so my name's Paul Morey. I'm the CEO and founder of um, Persian Infrared. And this is... I'm Matt Dodds. I'm commercial director um, at Infrared, um, Herschel Infrared. And could you um, tell me about Herschel's infrared heating technology and how it differs from other kinds of electric heating? Yep, so we introduced um, infrared technology to the UK about 14 years ago. Principal differences with most other forms of electric heating, they are aiming to heat the air volumes of spaces. Uh, which are then expected to try and heat the fabric of the property. Uh, with our heaters, we're converting electricity into radiant heat, which is directly heating mass and objects in the space. Uh, domestically, that would include the floors and the walls and your ceiling. In heritage and uh, warehouse style buildings, we're looking more about cones of heat produced from our heaters to directly heat people. So that's the principal difference is that you are it's similar to the sun and what's that that's producing in terms of the direct feeling of radiant heat from that and an open fire um, and then we're able to feel that direct feeling of heat even with temperatures around us being slightly cooler and it's more efficient to do that because we're not expected to heat at full air volume we're going through that to heat the mass and objects yeah i i visited your showroom and stood in front of one of the panels and one of the things that really struck me is that was when I was standing in front of it I found myself putting my hands out like I was in front of a fire because that heat was so similar it was such a beautiful warmth it was just amazing. So we've got that lots of people are historically used to the direct heating from probably stronger wavelength radiant heaters in outdoor spaces um, now we have those for certain environments, but domestically and in church environments, we're building up the temperature of what's around us and we've got zero light heaters to do that. But we, so it, domestically, we're looking at building up the temperature of what's around us, but we can also bring heaters closer to where people are to give them a for, more direct feeling of radiant heat. In church environments, we're looking at positioning heaters where people need to feel the benefit to get that direct feeling and mounting them above them to create the bubbles and feeling of warmth uh, around them. So that's the, the key distinction um, and the way we tackle the different types of properties. And I think it's worth adding that the, um, the form of heat is very natural. So um, we're used to convection heating, um, which is quite stuffy because the, the air gets hot or warm. Um, with infrared, it's a much fresher type of feeling of heat. So much more similar to kind of winter sun. Um, and our bodies have evolved over the millions of years to actually um, be, be heated by fire um, and the sun. So it's a very natural form of heating for us. And it's one, um, one of the key benefits of, of infrared is uh, people find it very comfortable. Um, so it's the, it's the form of heating we were designed for. Yeah. So you mentioned um, the, the church heating already, and that's one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in in talking to you about is the heritage range that you've developed because I've been speaking to an amazing interfaith group in Birmingham. I spoke to a, such a lovely chap called Takia who was talking about how they're not only mapping every faith building within the city, I think he said that they had over 800 so far, but they're, they're working with individual faith buildings to reduce the carbon footprint. And on average, I think they've reduced it by over six tonnes a year with each of the buildings that they've been looking at. So improving the fabric of the building, but obviously heating is a, a big part of this. So I, I wanted to ask you about the, um, the heritage range, like what inspired you to make it and, and how is it different from the, the domestic provision that you give? So the domestic are mainly panels, which you saw the showroom, um, and they're designed to be very discreet and um, give off quite a low intensity of heat because um, we don't want someone to be too hot. Um, so typically they go on the wall and the ceiling. If you put those same technologies into a large space, uh, it just won't be strong enough to heat you. So 
traditionally in say churches or, or halls and that kind of large space, um, people will be familiar with older fashioned, um, is halogen shortwave type heaters. So they are infrared, but they're very bright and they're very strong. Um, and the trouble with those, they're, they're better for outdoor heating because you need the intensity, but you put them in an indoor environment um, and they're, they're quite distracting for people. So if you're too close to it, you get a hot head and if you're um, too far away, you're kind of out of the zone. Um, but they're very distracting, especially in a, a, a faith type environment because you've got too much light. Um, so I think for some years we've been heating churches with slightly different technology. So we've always had this zero light, um, higher intensity infrared, but you can't see it. So it's just on the edge of visible light. As it gets hotter, it starts to glow. Um, and we've been using those in churches, but they were kind of commercial type heaters. So um, we've been heating warehouses and all those kind of things. And really, we were shoehorning the wrong heater into the into the wrong. I mean, it worked, but it aesthetically just wasn't um, wasn't doing the job. And then uh, last year, uh, a church architect actually was working for the Church of England, knocked on our door and said, "I've got this idea. I don't know if you guys are the right people, but could you combine um, a heater that we could suspend and integrate with lighting?" So. Uh, we had been thinking about this for some time and he kind of prompted us to, to actually do something about it. So we came up with the idea, he had some sketches of a chandelier type heater that could replace the lighting in churches um, and then heat the congregation, um, which is really important because it, you need to heat the people in churches, not necessarily the church itself or the building. So, um, and this is the, the difference. Traditional heating has been used to heat the building, not the people. So if you remember those old um, Victorian cast iron type, you'd have a big boiler system going, um, either oil boiler or gas, um, and the heat coming out of those, what they call radiators, aren't really radiators, they're mostly convectors. So most of the heat coming off that is heat in the air, and it just rises to the very high ceiling, not where you want it. And it takes days and days sometimes to, um, to achieve any form of comfortable heat, and, and sometimes just not possible. Um, so the combination of um, uh, the, the uh, sort of drive really from the church to say, can you guys produce something for us? Just kicked us into action on it. I've always thought it was a fantastic type of idea. And um, I think within two weeks, we, we'd sort of knocked something up for them. Um, Simon came back and um, he was just gobsmacked. He stood under it and you know, it was like, wow, this is, this is what we've been waiting. So, you know, I think his words were, we've been waiting 30 or 40 years at the church for this kind of thing. So, um, and off the back of that, we've actually built a factory here in Bristol um, to make the halo. They're being um, assembled here. And right now, as we speak, I think we've got two going off to Belgium, one to Germany. Uh, Matt's working on projects in Australia, yeah. um, USA. So it's not just a UK product, um, but it was all invented and started right here. And um, we're very proud of it because it's... Um, it's just a fantastic concept and product. Um, I think the other key thing with it um, is the ability to properly zone heat people within yeah. the area. So, um, and I said, you can't do that necessarily with wall mounted type heaters. So it does need to be something that um, that is effective, but also matches the aesthetic of the building. So, and we can adapt this to any environment. So, it, you know, for Church of England, they'll have a certain look, um, but other faith, um, We'll, 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 yeah, the, the whole thing can be adapted to, to match the aesthetic that they're looking for. So, um, or we can go very plain, you know. So, yeah, so, yeah think, it's great. One of the other key points, they've obviously got um, targets for decarbonisation by 2030, and it was looking at what the options could be to provide a comfortable level of heat, which is going to be effective, which isn't going to harm the fabric or have big impacts on, on those buildings. And that is one of the other key points that's coming out of all the projects I'm working on. It's it's a simple solution compared to most other options with minimal impact and it works and provides a really lovely level of comfortable heat quickly, which is the, the, the other key point. So. 
It's it's just so I love it because it's so smart. I I looked at the diagrams um in one I think it's the video of St Matthew's church in in Bristol and the cones of heat going over the congregation. It's like yes this makes it makes so much sense and presumably with installation there is literally only an electrical connection that's required am I right in yeah, thinking that's right. that yeah. that's it there's no pipes or I mean in the case of St Matthew's we just replaced the existing lighting. So so uh, there was no um disruption to the building. Um, and we might say it ourselves, but I believe it looks much better with our heaters in than it did with their previous lighting. It, it looks more substantial. It looks like it's been there. And we, you know, churches have been around for hundreds of years, a lot of them, and we want the heating to look as if it's part of the fabric of the building, um, hidden away, um, enhancing it, not um, not these sort of big ugly radiators you see. And, and um, any other solution just is that it, it, it detracts from the beauty of the place usually. So. Um, mm. There's a church in Somerset where we put one of our heaters into their Lady Chapel and they're about to look at more for the rest of it. But the comment that came back um, from them was that it looks like the heater has been in place for a huge number of years, <laughs> long periods. It's providing great output, but aesthetically it fits in so well. And and that was, again, a major hurdle that we had to get over with some of the, the groups that are giving permissions to put these heaters mm. in. And Dana, you know, in terms of installation there's plenty of electricians around so um if you compare to the alternatives i mean the church have to decarbonize church of england have stated it by 2030 um so they have to go electric you you can't have a or, or biomass or something but but primarily it's electric solution the alternatives are looking at are primarily heat pumps but um you know everyone knows are very aware of the the restrictions in terms of the expertise around on those but also the massive disruption to the building itself. So to be effective, they're usually under floor, which, uh, which means everything's got to come out. Uh, and we're talking um, huge disruption to the, to the building. Um, and then you've got the aesthetics of the unit outside the church it, itself and that kind of stuff. So this is just easy. And it's, it's an obvious solution um, that was kind of just waiting to happen, I think, so. Fantastic. One of the 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 benefits, obviously, you've already talked about, is decarbonisation, and also the ease of installation. Um, what are, are there any other benefits that people have talked about um, with your installations in terms of? I'm I'm assuming the feel of the heat as well. Are there any other things that people have talked about after having either the the halos installed or the domestic panels installed? So. From a heritage perspective, that certain church environments have not been able to use spaces in winter because of how low temperatures are getting. So it, it's bringing buildings back into use, and that's important as they receive funding from local authorities for community facilities, and that's becoming more of a feature. So it's, it's not just faith use, it's multi-use for the community, and it's giving them the opportunity to, to use spaces. But also break down which heaters are on in certain spaces at certain times for different activities. And the same approach applies to domestic environments where we're able to phase in the installation of our panels, typically in those environments, and also control them very carefully about, yeah, there may be rooms you're not using for certain periods that you have on a lower setback to improve the efficiency. And the same applies for heritage buildings and churches. Just focus the heaters being on where you need it, where the majority of the congregation are for certain periods of the week. And that is a key part of it and benefit that they've seen, certainly at St Matthew's. Yeah. I think one of the surprising things, the feedback from St Matthew's was um, the, um, the way people are drawn to the heaters, I think. Yeah. So they're saying, I think previously people would sit at the back of the church and sort of be dotted around all over the place. and. Um, we only on the trial put four heaters in. It needs, uh, they're going ahead now with the second phase, I think, to do the whole church. But um, uh, for that period last winter, everyone gathered around under under the heaters and it made the, the vicar very happy. I think that he had the congregation much closer to him. So, um, but uh, I think the other thing we can do is um, during the service, so they tend to put them on um, probably half an hour before the service on four, but we have three power levels. So as the the, Sort of bubble of heat warms up um you can reduce the, the the energy and the running costs and the temperature so it's just comfortable so i think they tend to turn them on to one third by the time they get to the end of the service 
which keeps people comfortably warm without wasting energy. So, yeah. yeah. And it, with the controls we offer, you can actually, if you've got a decent Wi-Fi connection, do that away from the building as well as at the building, which means you haven't got wardens going out at 11 or midnight the night before a service at 10 a.m. to put an older style heating system on. So um, the other point on St Matthews in terms of the, the costs there. So we look the existing system being gas against electric with our system. So on the face of it, in terms of your kilowatt hour pricing, you've got that differential. But the way they were running those heaters and what was independently assessed by a company on behalf of the Church of England was to see a 50 percent reduction in bills um, for that environment and an 85 percent reduction in consumption so what that translated to in terms of costs per service their gas system on average speaking to the treasurer is around 150 pounds when they take into account the preheating time and we were looking around 10 pounds for our heaters in the same space given the fact we can preheat 30 to 45 minutes in advance of a service at full power and then take the power levels down, which assists again in terms of overall cost. So I think there is a little bit of a misunderstanding and about the comparison. I was on a call earlier in the week where people are looking at the whole running costs for a full volume of space in a church or heritage environment and the cost of electricity against gas. And the thing, the key point you've got to get across is that the way we're heating these spaces is different. We're not looking at full volumetric heating of an air volume for significant periods. We're giving you benefit from a lower height, lower down, where you need it. That was one of the questions. Building, sorry, Emma. Yeah. Sorry, uh, go on. It applies equally to, um, we've got lots of church halls in this country, um, uh, public spaces. Um, so, I mean, it could be a, a lecture theatre or anything like that where you've, you've got a large volume. Um, and traditionally, I think the approach has been to heat the building and to try and heat the entire volume of the building. This is about heating the people in the building and when they're there. And it's um, it's a significant mindset change that we need to go through, I think, in terms of how we're gonna um, reduce energy use going forward. If we try to do the same thing we've always done um, with electric, which is what we've got to do, we're gonna we're gonna have too much draw on the grid, as everyone knows. So, so we have to look at these things differently. But as Matt said, you know, I think it's allowed people to effectively use the space um, in, in, in different ways. Um, we've had quite a few um, churches and um, places where they're, they're, there's, um, you know, they're used by playgroups and that kind of stuff. So um, now if they're, it would be economically unviable to heat that entire space, they wouldn't be able to run the playgroup, but because they can just put it on for the hour or so that, um, that the, the group's active and then turn off the heating, um, it makes all that stuff um, much more economically viable for the people so um yeah it's a win-win uh, we were hugely surprised with just how big a reduction on the energy bill we get we knew we save on units of energy um but to to save so much on against gas and we're uh, running electric was just incredible and they've got a benefit they're on a um uh they're on a co2 free tariff so they've gone they've, they've hit their target straight away and it's really easy you know so yeah way ahead of 2030 for Sitman. Yeah. And it is trying to look at reducing consumption overall. That, that's where we've got to be yeah. in terms of environmentally. Um, and how can we do that? So I'm dealing with some other bigger commercial buildings where historically they might have used gas to heat full volumes. But the first question I've got is, well, do you really, so they're saying we need to be heating the same again and the same space. And the first question should be, how do you operate in the space? And where do you want to be providing the benefit to try and look at the best way of heating you and the people working in there, typically, in the most efficient way without heating space you don't need to for long periods? And that's the shift that we've got to make. And that's both domestically, commercially and for heritage buildings, actually. Getting away from this central plant, central one system approach, we've got to be breaking it down much more to where we need the benefit and for how long. I was just thinking about... Um when you look after a building over the winter it's it's not just heating the people but also caring for the fabric of the building and preventing damp and things like that and 
at the back of my mind, I was worrying about this, but then I was thinking, if you're not heating the air, I guess you're going to be much more relaxed about opening windows and improving ventilation to reduce the risk of mould and damp. Anyway, is is that correct? Is that the way that you would manage the care of the building as well, that you're not constantly trying to keep an inadequate amount of hot air inside and you're just keeping it well ventilated? And it's, you know, historically, these buildings have not been heated with full volumes for hundreds of years. I think where you've seen, seen issues may have been on the fabric and maintain that because you're having, you know, pipe work that's leaking and making sure that's fixed. But actually, if you're too intense to draw out moisture or there's, there's too much of an effect of heating and cooling in those spaces, that's where some of the issues can come in with the fabric. So we've got to be slightly cautious of that. And that I think, yeah, the whole building fabric side, we can certainly get there and provide a background level of heat. And this is what some churches are considering with solar. So when that's generating for free in the winter, that's providing a background level of heat for free in these church environments. But the, the, we're not trying to look at a whole volume of air to heat the whole of the fabric of that property. Mm. I think in a domestic setting, um, you, you, you're in, I guess you're in a study or something um, yourself. You only need to heat that room probably for most of the day. You know, since the pandemic, so many more people work from home, as we know. Um, I read a report the other day saying people are going back to the office just to get some free heating. So, um, <laughs> um, but with our heaters, we do, for example, an under desk heater, which runs at 220 watts. So that's about, even with our latest prices, that's something like eight pence per hour. And that's enough to just keep you comfortably warm in that room. And then for the rest of the house, we just need to background heat. So if you had spare rooms you're not using, we wouldn't advise that they're left entirely unheated, but we can give a low level of heat just to to um, to keep the damp off and um, uh, stop stop the the building itself getting too cold. But you don't need to, you know, if you've got a spare room that's never used, um, it doesn't need to be heated to twenty one degrees. It just doesn't um, unless someone's there, and that's the benefit of infrared. It's modular. Um, you don't have to run a central system just to central boiler um, or a heat pump just to heat one room. Just on that, Emma, so they're just they're lots of customers typically domestically coming to us saying they've had quotes for other systems, which are typically central systems, which may well work in certain environments and be suitable. But I think it's the initial cost and that commitment now and how they're going to fund that. Whereas as we're phasing away from fossil fuel heating, there are options with our heaters to be installed in phases. So that and that's both gets them aware of the technology and how it can be applied and, and get the great feelings of it. And it quite often starts in an area of an extension or a few difficult to heat rooms where end of a pipe work run for, you know, a wet heating system might not be working properly. But um, it, it's a phased approach that can be looked at. It's not having to be a massive commitment now. So all we can work in conjunction with um, other technologies as well. So there's a combination there which some people want to look at but yeah majority at the moment are considering whole solutions with us in terms of when they're coming to us wanted to see what options there are there and in terms of the volatility of energy prices and the the rises that we've been seeing because of geopolitical factors i was thinking about if somebody perhaps in a domestic setting but perhaps some large community buildings would have the facilities to potentially have solar panels and a battery that you can charge overnight on a cheap tariff. Is that one of the ways to bring down the costs again after an initial outlay, of course, but is that what you would recommend in terms of you, if you had that budget, would that be a good way to mitigate the costs of electric heating as well? I'd certainly be looking at that to offset your running costs uh, alongside the controls and how you're setting up the heating. Uh, there may be other measures they'd need to look at that in terms of insulation and improvements to the fabric uh, that may improve on heat losses and, and um, reduce the consumption overall. Um, but yeah, they're, they're the key points. But so some customers of ours domestically are actually, when they've not been able to put in solar PV panels initially, have bought batteries which they then charge on a cheaper overnight tariff and then draw down on that during the day. And then as a phase two, they're putting PV panels in. But the, but the majority are coming and saying, look, we're, we're doing both. And that's a great way of 
looking to offset their costs. Mm. Okay, so in terms of if somebody going to the domestic side of things, if somebody is retrofitting a house or if somebody's in a new build and they're considering the different options between um, ways to decarbonize their heating, looking at heat pumps, air to air or, you know, ground to yeah. water systems or the infrared systems. What kind of things would you want people to know when they're weighing up which option to go for? What should they consider? Yeah, I mean, I think most of our customers go through that evaluation phase. Um, and obviously, the, in the press, there's a lot around heat pumps, so it's the first place people start looking. Um, alluded to what Matt said before, really, the, 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 the things you have to think about, you're, you're still running a central system. So say you're coming off a gas boiler or an oil boiler, um, the, I think everyone's aware you, um, the heat pump works at a lower um, water temperature to be efficient. So it's not going to run in the same way as your gas boiler, which is actually quite, uh, you know, it, it's got a high fast warm up. Um, you're going to have a much longer heating period. So you're going to run the system for quite a time to get the desired temperature. And we find a lot of people can't actually reach the desired temperature they want. So and um, I think in most studies we've done, we found that the heat pump needs to run more or less 24 hours a day to maintain the level of heat that people require. So you need to consider that you're going to have something that's running um, for a long time and may not hit, hit your peak demand. Um, and that's not quite how we live. You know, we, um, as we said, if you're, if you're working from home, you need to heat one room. That's, that's not necessary to heat the whole house. Your bedrooms, most people want it quite cool overnight and they're a fast warm up in the morning um, and they're off, you know, so you don't spend too much time in there. Um, that bedroom doesn't need to be heated all night. You wouldn't want it to be. So, um, so there's lots of things to think about. I think the major problem is it's such a big upheaval commitment because you have to oversize the radiators or put under floor in. So a bit like we were saying with the same thing for the churches, um, where infrared winds out is it's just so easy to install because it's it's no different to um, being able to install a light fitting or something. Do you know what I mean? It's um it's not a hard job for for a standard trade electrician. So they can be installed very quickly. There's there's minimal disruption, and you're going to use them in in different ways to what you're used to. But the main main benefit to consider, and it's only you've been to the showroom, so you've you've experienced the heat yourself. It's the level of comfort. So without exception, all our customers say, "Wow, I'm just wowed by the the feeling of the heat." And it's a really strange thing to try, kind of get get your head around until you've actually experienced it. But um, you'll be running them at lower air temperatures. So typically, whereas you might have been comfortable at say 20, 21 degrees with the infrared heater, you're, you're more likely to be something like 18 degrees. So you're saving on energy because you're not um, having to feel, having a higher um, air temperature to feel as comfortable, but it also feels fresher. We've got many customers who say it's, it's uh, massively reduced the damp because the infrared actually um, gets absorbed by the walls and the, the floor. So it drives out moisture. Um, and helps with things like dust um, circulation because we're not moving air volumes around. But um, yeah, so lots of things to consider. I think um, it, the other one is, the important one is obviously it's down to money um, and the capital cost. Um, we will find uh, it's about, I think, at least a third of the price of a heat pump to put our system in if you were putting, putting it into each room. Um, so, and then there's no maintenance. So... Um, we don't need any annual service. So I want to boil that, sorry, on well, any central system, but on a heat pump, you'd need a, an annual service. Um, so you have to factor those costs in and the life span of the system. So eventually that unit itself will actually need replacing as a gas boiler does. Um, the infrared panels, um, they're, they're solid state, so they're just going to stay and work for many years. If one does fail, eventually it's easy just to replace one panel. Um, you're not having a whole down of the system. We've all been there when the the, the boiler breaks or something and, you know, you, you, you emergency call out because nothing's working. So, um, so there's all those other aspects to consider. There's no noise. Um, a heat pump makes quite a bit of um, fan noise for, you know, where you're going to put it um, if you haven't got too big a garden. Um, but also the noise of the, the, the water going around the um, system, etc. So, you know, you're not getting woken up by clanky radiators. Um, and uh, risking leaky pipes when you come home off holiday and all that kind of stuff. So 
um, it, it's really, uh, uh, it's got so many benefits, you, it's worth looking into. And I say, it's, um, I think what we'll find overall is the payback. So it's, um, whenever we run the numbers, whilst we're gonna use more energy, if we ran it in the same way uh, as a heat pump, uh, and we can't get away from that because we don't have that coefficient that the heat pump can give, when you weigh in all the other costs um, and the higher capital outlay, then your payback goes so far out. We're looking at over 20 years normally, uh, which is beyond most people's time horizons. So um, that's one thing to consider. So we probably advise people, um, you're better to spend your money on insulation if you can, because that's going to reduce your energy costs. Um, if that's not possible, um, or, or you've got the ability to as well, then as we said earlier, solar um, uh, and some battery storage. Um, but you could do a whole house with solar and battery um, and infrared for the same price as a heat pump installed pretty much. So that's that's where it sort of comes down to and most people go, that's a, that's a sort of future-proof solution for me that I'm, I'm um, quite happy with. People like self-generating and not being quite reliant on the volatility in um, energy prices. So. Uh, in, when it comes to the entire life cycle of the, the product, you said it's solid state. So is that easy to recycle at the end of life? Yeah, I mean, there's two aspects to that. So we've our latest um, on, on the domestic side of things and on the, the, the heritage range as well. So on the halo, we've we've made them to be very long life. They're, they're mostly made from um, British steel. So we're made in the UK. Um, so we've reduced the sort of carbon footprint on the uh, on, on the manufacturing process. Um, they can be easily repaired. So we've made sure that our latest ones, um, if you took the halo, for example, there is one thing in there that will eventually fail, which is the heating element itself. There's there's um, 12 in a halo. They'll do something like 10,000 hours, but um, it's a really simple process. Just to, it's not much different to changing a light bulb to be able to replace that. And it's not a high cost part. So. Um, there's no reason why um, our heater shouldn't be in situ for many, many years. In the domestic setting on the panels, they can also be repaired. Um, and if you were to change a heating system and throw them out, they're over 95% recyclable because it's mostly metal. There's no harmful um, uh, chemicals or anything in there. So, and we've reduced down any plastic parts as much as we can, those kind of things. So um, yeah, we've done everything we can to, to make sure that it's a sustainable product both in the manufacturing and the end of life. It's fantastic. I love this. <laughs> there are so many things that are really annoying about the modern day, but this is not one of them. It just makes no, it's just... My view is simplicity is going to win out. So if you've got something that's simple to install, requires very little maintenance or no maintenance, um, we're moving forward. And it's just, um, I liken it to, I've got an electric car, so is Matt. Um, that's an advance in technology but also it's better you know i love my electric yeah, car I'll it's go back. much nicer to drive um i haven't had to have it serviced so you know that's just saving me i don't go to the petrol station and and you know waste time there no one likes that experience so um so that's actually improved my life and it's um uh, you know not creating any co2 once it's in use um and i think we need to do the same with heating we need to make people more comfortable um, more economically, but also, you know, take out the complexity. You don't don't need all these huge central systems that require masses of pipe work and um, uh, you know all, all that goes with it. Um, that's going, that's sort of staying backwards, and it's not the way we advance. You know, everything tends to get smaller and easier. And um, uh, some reason in the heating industry that they're they're kind of wedded to pipe work and water and um, <laughs> big clunky systems and you know, huge install costs and people have to drive around in vans maintaining it every year, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I think if you keep it simple, that's going to win through in the end. So, Yeah, I, I agree. So because of the, the aspect of the podcast where I'm looking at a more positive future, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that are a little bit unusual when it comes to uh, <laughs> podcasts. So thinking more broadly, if you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? And it can be something as you know obscure as a, a really annoying piece of legislation right through to an attitude or an aspect of human behavior. What would you change and why? Emma, for me, I think to keep it in line with the subject matter, um, 
obviously world peace and all that stuff but um, <laughs> uh, um uh i think the biggest thing for us would be to balance the gas and electricity price so the fact that we've the tariffs placed on electric i mean it's just crazy environmental tariffs on electricity um and we've got an artificially high electricity price um and supplies being blocked from you know all these renewable projects around that, that can't get onto the grid all this kind of stuff so um but the biggest single thing that would totally change our um and accelerate this this change to net zero would be um uh, that the gas and electricity price become uh, much closer because i guarantee you most people if faced with the same um uh unit price would favor an electric system of whatever whether it's infrared or anything else um uh, and you only stay with the old gas system or oil because it's per unit cheaper. Um, no one wants to be burning fossil fuels. Um, so and I think all the other legislation and the, the the grants and all that kind of stuff that's kind of secondary to saying actually if you know if, if we had a, a, a more equalised price structure, then that would just drive the change so much quicker. Yeah. I think that's much more cool. that would be my wish to um, that that. The, cut through all the all the different levels of politics and stuff but we've got to get to that stage where um you're doing you know we're, we're getting renewable energy in a sensible price um and we're using it sensibly but um yeah and we need to do it quickly we can't just hang around this is you know we've all seen the weather this year and what's happening so um yeah yeah totally agree yeah and then my next question is if you could invent anything what would you invent and why? Uh, I was thinking about, yeah, I, something that would generate electricity for next to no cost at a very <laughs> low level and whether that's on this planet or somewhere else, um, or harnessing that. Um, and that was the first point. Secondly, something that would insulate properties or improve fabric much more quickly uh, to speed up that process alongside what we're putting in. Um, as another option that we could invent um, and to get it's probably there not far away getting full audits and assessments of the whole UK housing stock to see exactly where we should be focusing and what and, and a very clear route then to show what the options are to get you there quickly to decarbonise your heating I could not agree more. That yeah. would be so lovely, wouldn't it? Having a world where that was actually managed well. Yes, I, 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 <laughs> that I would be so good. Well, you know, you're doing what well we're doing, are you? <laughs> so, I mean, we, 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 I mean, the nice thing about this industry and not in, in the company, um, we're we're free to to just do so. Just like the halo um, uh, that came about, and we and we can we can turn it around very quickly. So we've got a number of really exciting projects uh, and new um, uh, I, I'm just working with the philosophy that we should be able to um, not go backwards so I don't you know that talking about positivity the future should look really you know nice and comfortable we should be comfortably warm not worrying that because uh, of environmental concerns that we're going to be sat in you know, big coats all winter that kind of stuff um, and we can do it um, and companies like us are, are really pushing and trying to Bring those products out that that facilitate that um so we love it I and mean, we find it hugely driving for us to be um, producing and, and inventing new things that really help people and we get amazing feedback from our customers and that's the most wonderful thing you know um there's not too many companies where you're selling something where your customer comes back and says wow you know i just got to write back to you and tell you how amazing my new heaters are and i've told all my friends so most of our business comes from referral and it's people who heard of the products and um, from a neighbour or something like that or stayed somewhere with our heaters um, have been to a church or something with them in and just want um, to explore technology so um, yeah the future's very bright and I think people uh, you know we are great at, at, um, at solving problems as a as a um, humans it's what we've always done I don't see that we should have a future that's um, that going backwards we should be moving forward so I completely agree. And one of the things that I love that I've learned today is that the church 
architect came to you and that you collaborated yeah. on this. Yeah. I love that. I'm I'm really hoping that when this episode goes out that we're going to have a, a mosque architect and a gurdwara architect yeah, getting yeah. in touch saying, yeah. okay, this is what we want. This is going to be great. Yeah, I think we're close to our first mosque. We are close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's fantastic. This is, oh, I love this. I love talking to people doing really great stuff like you're doing. So thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are and, you know, and I've, I've visited your showroom and saw the production facility across the way. And yeah, I could see how busy you were. So I really appreciate this. Yeah. Well, thank you, Emma. We'll go and make some more heaters and um, yeah. <laughs> we'll Excellent. Some things to show. Well, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can find other research interviews in the Imagining Tomorrow playlist or go to www.foe.uk forward slash Imagining Tomorrow to find the episodes released so far or go to your podcast provider of choice and search for Imagining Tomorrow. Bye!